Thank you, and, and thank you everybody for coming. I thought uh, I would focus this talk today on positive ways that scientists and journalists can work together to educate and inform people and share some of the insights and excitement that come from your work. And so I thought I would uh, bring up some examples of science stories that got a lot of publicity and discuss what the scientists did to get so much attention and whether uh, they had to do anything to compromise their integrity in the process. And I also want to talk about ways that I think you can help promote a genuine understanding of science, even uh, in a media atmosphere that can be uh, dominated by superficiality and hype. And you welcome interruptions. Yes, and I welcome interruptions. I, I, I think that that, uh, that works really well. I like the way that. picture is this? I don't know. I just found that. <laughs> um, yes, that, I just thought that would be a, a good illustration of uh, selling your soul. Um, so in, in thinking about this talk, I started to contemplate you know, what scientists and journalists have in common. I thought maybe a good place to start uh, thinking about working together would be to, to think about where we have common ground. And I came up with a couple of ideas. I thought, well, you know, we both really have some, some common values. We value uh, reason and evidence over uh, the power of authority. And I think we're both often driven by curiosity. Uh, and also, I think both professions try to employ techniques that help us to portray the world as it really is, as opposed to the way we want to see it or the way that the government or the church or other people want us to see it. Um, and we also, uh, I think, have some common ethical rules. I mean, plagiarism is bad in uh, both fields, uh, and there are a lot of rules about how you cite or quote other people. And uh, also, uh, making up data is really the other big no-no, which for you means uh, measurements or observations, and for us means observations or quotes. So for the... Um, benefit of those who aren't at my first talk, I thought I would just give the sort of 45 second uh, introduction to uh, sort of uh, what I do and where I come from. I'm a professional journalist. I specialize in science and I've written for a number of different publications, The Economist, Science News, New Scientist, and Science where I was a staff writer uh, for the news section writing about physics. And uh, later I worked as a staff writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is the main newspaper that serves the Philadelphia region. And while I was there, I uh, covered news about science. I also wrote two weekly columns. The first one was called Carnal Knowledge and was about sex, believe it or not. And I thought that actually might make the topic for my third lecture while I'm here. Uh, the second one was uh, called Planet of the Apes, and it was about evolution. And uh, as you can see from this slide, um, one of the great things about being a science writer is it's one of the few professions where you actually don't spend most of your time sitting in front of a computer. I would guess I spend uh, less than a third of my time actually sitting in front of the computer trying to get words to come out of my head. And most of my time really doing research, which sometimes means talking to people and sometimes it means going out in the field and experiencing things. Here I am. Um, floating weightless in a NASA uh, astronaut training plane. This is actually a scene from my most recent uh, science adventure. This is actually in Haiti, believe it or not. I'm with a team of biologists and they uh, dropped us off in a piece of forest that's uh, one of about 1% uh, of the remaining forest in Haiti. And part of the mission there is to collect samples of some of the plants and animals and freeze them because that in 10 years, that's really all that's gonna be left of some of these things. So these are the kinds of experiences that really can shape your perspective on life and uh, humanity's role on this planet. So uh, my, uh, I currently I'm really a, uh, a freelance writer, and though I have a couple of steady gigs, and one of them is with uh, this website. This is NewsWorks, which is a website associated with WHYY Public Radio in Philadelphia, and it's uh, becoming a competitor to the Philadelphia Inquirer as everything moves toward the web. This is uh, Lightning Rod. This is the science blog that I write. It's sort of a hybrid between a, um, a newspaper column and a blog. So enough about me. Uh, let's talk about some of these big stories that got so much publicity. This is uh, probably the story that uh, I'd say uh, got more fanfare than anything else in 2012 by far, and that is the finding of the Higgs boson. 
And um, I know that there was a, they got a certain amount of uh, publicity because of the uh, reference to the God particle. And in fact, uh, the executive editor at the Inquirer, where I worked at the time, told me that he wasn't really interested in the story until he heard that it was the God particle, and then he thought it was intriguing. But I honestly think that there was a lot of excitement surrounding this, and it would have gotten a lot of attention even if that uh, little bit of marketing had never been invented. And part of the reason for that was the way that the physicists presented this finding, which was very interesting. Um, they made it really sort of come out as a big piece of news and a discovery, even though if you talk to the physicists, they say, well, there's no actual thing. You can't really see the Higgs particle. You know, it instantly decays into other particles that leave tracks in the detector, and there's not even a, a uh, smoking gun kind of set of tracks that must be the signature of the Higgs. Instead, uh, almost anything that could be the Higgs or anything that could be the Higgs could also be left by uh, events that have nothing to do with the Higgs. So the way you find a Higgs is to gather a lot of data and then make a statistical argument. And that's all great, but it doesn't really lend itself to the kind of drama that gets you on the front page of the newspaper. So uh, how did the scientists deal with that? Well, I think they really did uh, a good job of building up suspense. In this case, uh, they sent out one press release in, I think it was December of 2011, uh, announcing that they sort of had the Higgs, but that they weren't going to quite go all the way out on a limb and announce it. And you might think, well, that would sort of take the wind out of their sails. But actually, uh, for people that cover lots of different fields of science, it, it got it kind of in our consciousness and on the radar screen. And so I think it primed reporters for what happened the following June when we got another press release that said they're going to announce something really big on the 4th of July. And by then, I think a lot of us realized that, well, if they announced the Higgs, that's great. And if they announced they ruled out the Higgs, that would be pretty exciting, too. So, so they had our attention. And then uh, when they did uh, make their big announcement on the 4th of July, it, uh, it made uh, front page headlines all over the world. Do you think it would have been different if they hadn't had this fiasco or the speed of light? I'm going to get to that. That's interesting because I, I don't think they're really. Because <laughs> I was going to bring that up as a further down the road. I didn't want to start with that story. I thought I would start with one that turned out to be real. I think that's <laughs> as far as we know anyway. But but I am going to deal with that. I don't think those are related exactly except, well, we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, I think that there, uh, there were a couple of uh, positive things about the way this was presented. One, it it, uh, it kind of uh, plays into the way that uh, people in broadcast and daily media think. I mean, that they give priority to things that you can say happened that day or yesterday. And so even though nobody actually grabbed a Higgs particle the day before, it was an announcement, it, it sort of brought everybody together and made it feel like there was a real event. The downside is that reporters are competitive and news organizations are competitive, and so nobody is going to say to their boss, look, you know, this, this is too complicated, I need an extra day. Like, that's not going to happen. Everybody is going to have to have it out the next day, complicated as it is. And so I think that can lead to reporting that either has errors or, in some cases, is kind of superficial. And uh, the thing that I uh, that I didn't like about some of the stories that came out about the Higgs was they just kept things too much in the scientist's language. And so uh, the message that I think the public got was, well, this is interesting, but it's just over my head. It's too hard. I can't understand this. And I don't think that's really the message that you want uh, to give people. Okay. Uh -huh. Do you think that that's another reason uh, for somebody like CERN to give the reporters, you know, six months to sort of like, you know, figure it out? I mean, it seems like, sure, they might have had one day, you know, from the press release to having to write a story, but they had six months to sort of prepare for one of two storylines. Yeah, that's true. And a lot of us did. Those of us who, who uh, cover science exclusively, I think, kind of knew. And I think I, the guy that covered it for the New York Times knew, and I knew. Um, so lots of people were ready, but... But then it was also covered by a lot of news organizations that don't really follow science that closely. And so uh, those people are covering all kinds of other things.
things, you know, politics and business. And so, you know, we kind of jump from story to story, and there isn't a lot of in-between time. Um, so I think uh, you still see people like scrambling and rushing around when something's announced. And, and also with the web, it's not even, I mean, I used to think it was a tight deadline to write for a daily paper because something would be announced, you know, at a press conference the day before, and you'd still have that afternoon to call a couple people and, you know, get some perspective. And now it's like they want something on the web, like, in five minutes, which is <laughs> what's scary. I try to resist that, but then there's time wasted, like, fighting with editors and explaining why you, you don't really want to do that. So for the uh, biology people here, I thought I'd uh, bring an example from that field. This goes back a little further, but I thought that this uh, story was interesting because it was played in kind of a similar way in that there was no sort of moment, of eureka moment with the genome project. And uh, from what I understand, uh, even when the announcement was finished, there were still sort of details and missing pieces and things people working, were working on. So there was kind of a, a decision on the part of the collaborations to come together and announce that they were finished. And so there was a certain amount of, of uh, manufactured excitement here. Um, they actually sent a press release out about a year early uh, saying they had, I don't remember exactly uh, what they said they'd achieved. It was some kind of milestone, like a draft sequence or something. And so that, that also got it on people's radar screens and reminded people, oh yeah, they've been working on this genome thing for a long time. Like maybe we should start thinking about that. And then uh, they got some press on that. And then a year later, they came out saying they were finished and they got lots of uh, publicity. Here you can see the cover of Time magazine. Um, the downside is, you know, this is a little misleading, cracking the code. I mean, they didn't exactly figure out what the ge how the genetic code works. That had already been done. They had, it was more like reading three billion letters of code. So, uh, you know, this, this kind of makes it sound like, uh, you know, the Enigma code or something. Um, and there was also, again, kind of a mad scramble, I think, on the part of uh, news organizations to make something coherent out of this. And there wasn't much time for people to question some of the claims that came out. And in, in this case, you know, I think with the physicists, there was a lot of genuine excitement. Here, there was, I think, a pressure on the part of the scientists to make it sound like this was going to be immediately useful. So there was this long list of diseases. You know, the Genome Project is going to lead to cures for cancer and Alzheimer's disease and autism and schizophrenia. And the list kind of went on. And, and people tended to repeat that. I think probably a, a fairer way to say it was that the Genome Project was uh, a tool that might be useful for scientists that were studying some of these things. This is an example of what not studying themselves? Well, this I think, you know, and I, I want to sort of back up now and say, you know, I think that uh, creating a sort of a, uh, I'll, actually I want to, um, I'll go to the next slide here. Um, this is, a, this is a book that I read a long time ago. I thought it was really interesting. It's, it's by Daniel Borstein. It's called The Image. And it's about the way that the media uh, work. And he uses a term pseudo-event. And pseudo-events refer to uh, press conferences and ceremonies and all kinds of things that people do to try to get attention and then turn it into a sort of a media event. And uh, you know, so when these stories come out, I think about pseudo events, and I think in the case of the Higgs boson, um, I think that it actually that they didn't sell their souls, um, except for the God particle thing. But the rest of it was okay because I think it was channeling the genuine excitement that people were feeling in the field and trying to help people share in that. I think with the genome, the uh, you know all of the disease promises, that's starting to veer into uh, more misleading territory. But you're not, you know, both of the examples you've shown are cases where the results, the discoveries, the, or the, the culmination of the project were, were two groups involved. Yes. And the decision to make the announcement and to arrange it, present it, and how it would be presented was effectively a political decision on the, on the part of CERN on the one hand and the U.S. government yeah, I think that's a really important so point. These were not just, uh, these aren't typical events. These are massive, big size yes. events where politicians or, and or you know, administrators of <coughs> big labs essentially are in control. Well, it's very it, atypical. Yeah, and I guess I would I would actually wonder whether it seemed like the scientists must have had a lot of input on the Higgs because they were able to sort of coordinate at a time uh, when they there was a whole political story mm -hmm. about what you know two collaborations and you know, 
which was never reported. Well, that and might be one for me to come back <laughs> on then. It would be pretty interesting. Um, well, it was well known, but, you know, if you can you go back a slide? Go back. Uh huh. So there's a lot of richness to this. First of all, these two guys hated each other. Oh yeah, yes. This is, um, <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> they spent they spent years knocking each other in the press, with Francis Collins having the Los Angeles Times in his pocket, <laughs> and, and Craig Venta having several other organizations in their pocket. So they they both had public relations teams killing each other. One was for profit. One was government money and foundation money. One was giving away the data free, one was selling the data. Mm -hmm. so it, and it was out of that chaos that Clinton decided to stop this. And he you know, he got, uh, uh, what's his name from England at the time, the, his favorite prime minister, and uh, Tony uh, Blair. He, he and Tony Blair got on the TV and announced that the project had been completed, when it wasn't. Right? It was about eighty-five percent complete, but in outline, and it was it was quite a mess, and and almost the whole community uh, sort of rallied around it to try to save it. I mean, it, it was a really interesting, uh, rich story. Um, of competition in science and a lot of other kinds of aspects. Yeah, and I think there were some books that came out that, that got into that. And both of these guys don't have any souls to sell. I, <laughs> <laughs> Even him? Yeah, he thinks he does. <laughs> he, he doesn't, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's a, actually, if you're a reporter, he's mean to all reporters. He's nice to all reporters. Or <laughs> should point out we're recording. And he does. <laughs> he also wrote a book where he didn't really uh, believe in evolution. Well, who? Francis Collins? Oh, yeah. Well, that's because he's uh, his new. Th I mean, he's he's religious and he's kind of in the in that gray zone. He's not quite an intelligent design person, but a lot of what he says that's a whole other a whole other discussion. But uh, in fact, we could, I could make my last talk about religion and science too, um, which is another thing I was thinking about talking maybe about. Maybe one of the questions is uh, why did the media go with this fairy tales as opposed to the real tale? Well, I think that, you know... The subsequent books about these. Things. There are books. I think that the best, because because of the competition, again, because everybody sort of, there's this press conference and you have to come up with something. And then the best you can do is say, well, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. It's sort of, I, the, the, the trick to covering it is not to try to guess what is really there, but just say they're making this announcement and give the background, what this project is supposed to be about, that there are these two different people and one of them is privately funded and one of it is, one of them is publicly funded. Um, so I think that uh, you know the best stories are the ones that step back, and probably the the, the best coverage is going to come out in books. But I, you know, I I wrote about this. I don't think that what I wrote was fairy tale. It was just uh, you know covering what I did know about the announcement. I just called it fairy tale to kind of be provocative. I mean, because actually, I, the science is really interesting, and the science needs to be communicated. And as we talked about before, journalists often have this this instinct to, to go for the, the blood-stained, you know, and knife and, and, and the drama and stuff. And we can overdo that very often and lose the science. So I'm wondering, in, in relation to these two um, uh, examples that you're showing, uh, where the media, as it were, and where scientists uh, either um, did something right or, or failed to do something that should have been done, or or what the real structure of what was going on was. Yeah, I mean, in this case, there probably is no single story that really covers it. It is a book, you know, that it just there's a lot of complication and uh, financial ties and intrigue and personality issues that come through here. But the, I think that, that at the same time that the public has a right to know there was a lot of public money spent on the genome. And so I think people, that the press has an obligation to try to uh, learn what we can about what they actually set out to do, how much of it they achieved, and, uh, you know, check in to some of the speculation on why it might be medically useful. Then there's limitations, because in a book you can go into all this interesting detail. On a, on a web blog or a TV show, obviously you're not going to. So. You know, but what's going to get the most play? Is the yeah, but you look at from the point of view of the general readers, they don't know what a genome is. They don't know what the genome project is. They don't know what any of this is. They just know that three billion dollars were spent on it, uh, government money, and and they uh, and they have a right to to know at least as much as I can dig up about 
I, what this is all about. So then why do we call it the God particle? I tried to avoid that. <laughs> In fact, I only wrote about the God particle to make fun of uh, the people who use the term well, God particle. Yes. really dedicated, but a lot of people are just like, oh, the God particle, okay, let's throw that onto the, you know, the airwaves. Yeah, well. <laughs> because people don't know what. Yeah, it's confusing. It should never have that, you know. I thought that would die out. It actually, it's really old. I think Leon Letterman's book uh, used that as a title in 1993, and you think it would have. People would have gotten tired of it by now. <laughs> I, I've got a question because it's something that happens, as you've pointed out repeatedly, in, in cases like global warming, which is why didn't somebody write the obvious headline, which is $3 billion wasted collecting useless information, <laughs> which is the scientific fact. Well, you you wouldn't you and you can't do well. Okay, I'll let you finish. Right. So so why why not take that line? I would say that that would differentiate you much better from the mass and would get you a lot more attention. It's pretty hard to defend that though. Well, no, actually, I'll tell you what I actually did do. First of all, you you know this is sort of similar to the arsenic bacteria story, and that I you know I knew right away that this was hype, and I actually didn't write about it the very first day because I, I feel like when you want to debunk something, you really do need to take a little time to make sure that you know what you're saying when you say somebody is full of it. And there are thousands of kids who've been had their metabolic diseases diagnosed because of the Genome Project. There there is a whole area of cancer biology that relies on the Genome Project for drug development. There. Right, it's been useful. I mean, it, it is not a, uh, anyway, isn't, isn't what this that's a side discussion. Said, right? but, but I think, yeah, that's a, and that's a, that's a side discussion, though. I think that uh, the approach here is, you know, you can't just debunk something out of hand. But I did write a, a story about a week later that put some of the promises in perspective and talked about how, well, this is a tool that people will use, and we can't, they can't really promise that it's going to lead to these cures, but that, it, that a lot of scientists think it will be useful. If one is going to complain about the media, especially the examples you gave, are examples where you know you, you can just get all the information from these big organizations that are justifying what they spent billions on, uh, and, and it's clearly, I mean, I think they're both obviously justified. But there are many cases where you know you actually have to go out and get the information. So I can even think of examples in science, of big science that has cost half a billion dollars and has produced very little. I won't name the example. Uh, but and in fact, there were, there were no big press conferences announcing the results of some of those experiments. They, in fact, were big failures. This is something that is never reported. That's, well, that's, we should talk after. The, we, we, I, I should come by and talk to you about this. Because <laughs> part of the reason I'm here is to look for things that aren't. Lacking often is what I would call investigative reporting. Yeah, I agree. It's hard to do. And, and in science, you know, you, you, some of these things are experiments. And the question is, are they. Give you an example to get the biologists rattled. There are uh, investigative reporting at this point in time would be extremely useful. To uh, before the money is spent, to investigate the European project to spend a billion euros, yeah, the the brain. Brain. a simulation of the brain, and then the American project, which is going to outdo the stupidity of the European project, <laughs> and the Chinese by spending three billion dollars <laughs> on a complete mapping of somebody's brain. Uh, now there is a project. Is it good? You know where. Both countries, for whatever reasons, and uh, interesting speculation can be made by, I'm sure, people in this room, <laughs> has it latched on to spending, you know, in our couple times, billions of dollars in euros on a project which, at least my friends, uh, confirm my suspicion that it's totally crazy. Well, I think that is, an, that is a good one, and that, that the time to talk about those is early. Um, you know, I mean, it's science. Sometimes the experiments don't go the way you want, so everything, this right? This hasn't been done yet, yeah. but it's before the public. So they're going to spend $3 billion of our dollars on a project which uh, has not been really aired in the scientific community. And, uh, you know, the press is 
its responsibility is not just to come after the fact and after the disaster, but you know, this is nor is it to take all of its cues from the organizations that are promoting it. That are selling it. Well, that's that true. It happens all the time. It's happening. Well, then that's because of the way that they that people were sort of rushing to get a story in the press. But there were a lot of other skeptical stories in there and, and discussions with scientists about what the genome could and couldn't do. And I think, uh, you know, the stories about this brain project that will be useful will be ones where people spend a lot of time and do some legwork and talk to a lot of people about why they think it will or won't be useful and what it would or wouldn't accomplish. And that way that the readers um, and the taxpayers can get enough information to make, uh, you know, make good choices and uh, should be able to decide for themselves whether they think that it's useful. I mean, there is a certain amount of arbitrariness. Some people think that sending humans to Mars is a great idea, and other people say that's expensive and it won't be uh, scientifically fruitful. And you know, we could discuss that all day. Um, so there are, you know, there's certain subjectivity in what people find um, interesting and useful. But the I same thing about sending people to the moon. Yes. <laughs> There's also a lot of politics, stuff too. I mean, you know, I think people have known for a long time that mammography was an ineffective uh, tool for um, preventing cancer. But try to get somebody to publish that until very, very recently. Yeah, well, people wanted to see, you know, they had some studies that were pretty definitive, and that was enough, you know. I mean, you can't, you, you sort of need something to, to go with. So, I mean, reporters don't want to go up against the um, established powers very often because you've got a tremendous amount of pharmaceutical uh, and nonprofit lobbying uh, in, in industry united uh, around uh, saying that mammography saves X number of lives, which was basically it was a lie and they knew it. But nobody wanted to attack it because it was really unpopular. I don't know. I think, you know, actually, I think that, that we do want to, I mean, we want to be on the right side. And if we think that everybody else is, you know, that there's something that people don't know that's really important, I think we, I, I want to jump on it. It's just that I don't want to be wrong, so I want to be careful. You know, you don't want to be wrong when you're going on a limb saying something that people say saves lives doesn't. You want to make sure that you actually know what the heck you're talking yeah, there's about. There's plenty of reporters that actually, and scientists that they, that they were, well, sources that knew this, uh, Sean Carroll, for instance, you know, I was trying to write this 10, 15 years ago. And uh, you can't get published for certain types of things. You can get published for public relations generated you know, um, fluff. But try to get published for something that really knocks the socks off a scientific enterprise. It's a different matter. That is, that is true. It can be, especially if you're a freelance writer, as I have been for the last only three months, um, and I will start to learn uh, how much harder it is to sell ideas like that that are new and different. And editors, of course, are reluctant partly because they want to be, they don't want to be wrong. You know, I mean, I think we're all, uh, i actually more cynical about it. I think that they just, they don't want to go up against the people that are buying the ads. That may be. I don't think so, though. I think, well, the Inquirer, I mean, one of the things that made the Inquirer a great paper when I first joined was that they they were good at investigative reporting, and they did go out on them. They didn't care who advertised, but that changed. And by the last five or six years I worked for them, it was a totally different paper than the paper I had joined. And I, I think that that's true about with big regional newspapers across the board. So we're in a, a time of real transition in the world of journalism. So let's see. Oh, and I was just going to, uh, as an aside, um, say that I think that, you know, news stories, when you look at, when I look at sort of uh, science writing as a reader, and I've been a reader of science writing longer than I've been a writer, um, that really what, you know, newspapers that headlines, they end up, you know, in the bottom of the bird cage. And what really matters is what people uh, end up with in their heads. And they really, news stories, I think, are, even though they get big headlines, are the least memorable of the types of science writing that I've read. I mean, what I end up remembering are big feature stories in, in books. And I still think some of the best uh, writing I've, that I've read to date on uh, physics was probably in, in Gary Taub's book, Nobel Dreams, which I thought captured some of that politics. This was a sort of a different particle hunt, but I thought he did a really nice job. He should have done the same, same kind of book for the Higgs, but he caught the sort of intellectual challenge of finding, in that case, it was the W and Z bosons, and he captured the technical challenges, and he captured the political 
and social challenges of having these different competitive groups and having to sort of figure out how to uh, not kill each other over this. And um, and I think one of the best, uh, some of the best writing on cosmology that I've read is still uh, Dennis Overby's writing in um, Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos, which also uh, caught the uh, kind of the intellectual challenges of understanding the universe and also the sort of social and political issues involved. And I think is better than the writing he does for the New York Times, partly because he was able to really step back and I think uh, get the big picture. And that's really sort of where I want to go next in my career, because I think newspaper writing is confining and limiting, and that at some point you have to step out of that and think about writing books. So uh, let's see. Let's. What do I have next? Okay. I uh, I promised. Uh, actually, I promised one of the biologists at the multicell group that I would talk about this. I don't know. Some of the physicists might want to forget that this thing ever happened. But uh, but it was interesting. I think there's. Uh, it's worth discussing because I think there's sort of a, a teachable moment involved with this story. This was a something that happened in the fall of uh, 2011. Uh, it was out of CERN. It was an experiment. Uh, pretty cool. It involved sending a beam of neutrinos more than 500 miles through the ground. Um, to Italy, yes. So uh, across a border, even. And I mean, that alone is actually kind of amazing to most people. They're just like, what? <laughs> That's amazing. You can send this beam of neutrinos, and most of them go right through the detector, but you catch a few. So, you know, it actually would have been kind of an interesting story uh, just to write about the experiment itself. But the people doing the experiment thought that they had detected that the neutrinos were actually arriving about 60 nanoseconds ahead of where they should have been if they were going the speed of light. So that's a pretty shocking finding. And I think the reason this story got a lot of press was that it would be a big deal if it were true, because um, it would violate Einstein's relativity. So uh, there are really, um, let's see. Uh, there are really two interpretations, two obvious interpretations of what's going on here. Um, this is uh, the New York Times story on it. Um, one, that uh, Einstein's relativity will have to be uh, rethought or modified because these neutrinos really went faster than the speed of light. And the other explanation, that the experimentalists made a mistake, did something wrong. And of course, one of these explanations is a lot more likely than the other, and one of them is a lot more exciting than the other. And so, uh, not too surprisingly, a lot of the press kind of pushed the more exciting possibility. I thought I'd, I'd uh, read a little piece of, uh, this was a columnist, Charles Krauthammer, actually picked up on this story. And here's what he said about it. He said, um, the world as we know it is on the brink of disintegration, on the verge of dissolution. Oh. No, <laughs> I'm not talking about the collapse of the euro or international finance, of uh, the Western economies, of the democratic future, and then he goes on and gets kind of wordy. He says, I'm talking about something far more important, which is why it only made the back pages of your newspaper. Though it actually made the front pages of some newspapers. Um, if it made it at all. Scientists at CERN have announced the discovery of a particle that can travel faster than light. So uh, anyway, you now you might think it's obvious why it's much more likely that these experimentalists made a mistake than that Einstein somehow uh, made a mistake in formulating relativity. But to the general reader, that's not obvious at all. And I think that's why this is sort of a nice teachable moment because uh, it actually gives gives you an opportunity to explain to the public uh, why it is much, much more likely that the experimentalists made a mistake. Um, I remember when this story uh, first broke and I was talking to a theoret theoretical physicist about it and he said, well, it's definitely wrong because it's not theoretically justified. And I knew what he was saying and you know what he's saying, but to the general public, this is, sounds really weird because they're thinking, I mean, first of all, the word theory is uh, confuses people. Um, you know, that, the biologists deal with that all the time, but people still, because we use it in, in sort of common speech as speculation, as this idea, and so people think, well, the, you know, any theory of, I mean, experiments are real, that's data, that's real, and theories are ideas, so, you know, if the data says one thing, then the theories have to give way, and so I think there's a there's an opportunity for you to step up and explain why that's not, probably not the case, and that Einstein's theory is backed by a lot of experimental evidence and a lot of observations. 
conditions and that uh, it's a lot more likely that, and that this experiment was, uh, you know, it was a pretty difficult experiment to get right and a lot of things that could have gone wrong. And eventually they did figure out, I think they did figure out what they did wrong and they went away and... They figured it, not only, I mean, this was a bad mistake. <laughs> <laughs> this was a trivial mistake. Oh, okay. We had a cable that was just not screwed in all the way. So that was not the kind of, I mean, sometimes experiments go wrong and there are subtle, even important people that you know, will learn something from you. Right. In this case, we'll learn that somebody will simply take it away. But you know, the interesting thing in this example, which I'm not sure the story is find the report of that ending, I mean, this was a great example of science at work. The experiment was repeated. With the, with the cable system. still loose, though. No, no, a different experiment. Oh! At using the same beam, the CERN beam. This experiment, by the way, was an Italian experiment in Grand Sasso. It's not a CERN experiment. The only involvement was CERN, CERN supplied the neutrinos. But, mm -hmm. And it was announced there. And, and uh, so they redid the experiment independently and found the opposite result, which is one thing you should do. And number two, when the experimenters, who hadn't yet submitted a paper, who was in the process of being refereed, hadn't published it, uh, found the error, the collaboration, again, this is big science, there were 400 people in the collaboration, uh, fired the leaders. So the scientists who led this group actually paid uh, for their error. Something which doesn't happen often, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Science, but they pay, they lost their job. But there is also another aspect that this was not hype in the sense that the scientists did claim that their measurement showed higher than, than light speed. So, and, and this was very. They did, they did, but the did, physics so community some, didn't think they were right. Didn't misunderstand it. Yes. Because very clearly, the statement by part of the scientists, and this was, you know, a collaboration with CERN, so it was, you know, high uh, authority. Uh, and uh, I mean, what David said is is all fine, but I, I don't see that that uh, the, the, the press made a big mistake here. The mistake was just the scientist's mistake. In this case. I think in this case, though, if you talk to enough uh, physicists outside of this group, you get the you know you do you do get the impression pretty fast, or I did as a reporter, that uh, it was much more likely that this was uh, a mistake than that it was correct, and oh, that sure. it still so had to be you know. I mean, but. That's true. Yeah. Because this knew it was wrong. Yes. We knew it was wrong. You knew it was wrong, right. For many reasons. Some because, you know, there was no, nobody had any good idea of what, what you would do if it was correct. And there were, and besides which, there were many experiments that directly measured the speed of neutrinos in other ways. Yes. Like from the, from the sun. Solar. Yeah, or the supernova, right. And, and they went I lot predicted further. this by a factor of a million. Yeah. So it was clear. Everyone was, you know, on high the iron Yeah. Sure that it was wrong. The, the big story there uh, was CERN, again, CERN politics. CERN, the, the normal thing would have been that the Grand Sasso people would have announced the result at Grand Sasso. There would have been a press conference, but not at CERN, Grand Sasso. They wanted to announce it at CERN because it's a bigger, has a bigger voice. And there was a fight over that. And, and the top administration said, we will hold the conference at CERN. And many of the people at CERN uh, were very upset by that. I can imagine. <laughs> Especially right. now. Because they were putting themselves out on, on exactly this kind of lending, yes. lending authority. So there was an interesting story there. Uh, but you know, it's a great teachable moment about the scientific method. Yes, exactly. And the uh, the other thing that I thought the way that people like Charles Krauthammer kind of distorted it was that they played it like if this is real, then Einstein is sort of discredited, and he's going to be. You know, you know. I find it absolutely charming and wonderful that people care that much. Uh, they so the general public really. Kind of, um, yes, story, you brought their that, attention. What is that? But what does it tell you? It tells you that they understand, as they should, that their that physics has established certain things with such certainty 
that their overthrow or their, their negation would be my uh, world shattering. Uh, yes. Saddam yes. That doesn't happen in many scientific films. <laughs> well, I was wrong. The weather tomorrow will be this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you publish something on Einstein and not on the second law? There are much more crackpots that announce that they in the second law. Almost about that. Oh, you don't read about it about the crackpots? Uh, well, who, 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 who proved that was wrong all the time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of us have files from crackpots. <laughs> but uh, but when CERN holds a big press conference, then you think, okay, this isn't this is more than crackpots. We should pay attention. Like, what are they actually trying to tell us? So, um, yeah, there there are a lot of crackpots out there. Um, there might be one that's right somewhere. It's hard to tell. Um, but see, but that's good that we're not, you know, covering every crazy announcement that somebody sends us. But your your article here is excellent. Oh, that's not mine. I know, but the one you're showing is excellent. Oh, okay. It says, if true, it would be very important, but it seems highly unlikely it's going to be important. Yeah. I think that, uh, that that's, yes. Where does it say that? Oh, probably some experimental error. Well, yeah, that's true. Really that's really that is the norm. Yeah, that's a pretty good argument. Yeah, no, I think it's fine. Yeah, it's actually has a lot of physicists as sources. And those yeah, no, and as I said, I still think. I mean, Mike, I think that he's done some of the best writing about cosmology. His book was really, um, you know, I still thought it was really memorable. So um, I shouldn't have. Yes, that was probably the wrong caption to put there. But uh, so forgive me for that because I think that this article is fine. Yeah, the teachable moment is a good example. I mean, he's, he's done a good job yeah. of saying, hey, this is intriguing, but it's probably and actually, wrong. Yeah, and all, the fact that it's, it's not on the front page is probably reasonable also, as much as Crowdhammer would think it belongs on the front page. I think this is probably where it belongs. Um, it's in their science section on the inside somewhere. What happened with Fox News? Did they report it? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> they report things. You know, they do a little bit of science reporting, not really investigative, um, but... Uh, you know that they, the, I, if it's if it either is sort of supports a conservative agenda or it's neutral, they'll they'll go after they it. Darwin was wrong. Oh, they they would. It, well, they 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 will any chance they get report to Darwin is wrong. <laughs> Coming back to the CERN project, do you think that the general public is becoming aware of the fact that science is becoming more resource intensive, or or resources are increasingly concentrated into? Well, some of these big projects appear just very recently, and it seems that more and more will appear, as, as you pointed out, the Brain Project and, and others. So is, is the general public aware of, of, of this transformation? You mean toward big science in all these well, different fields? Whatever you call it. I, I'm just trying to observe it. Yeah, I guess, you know, big science is sort of the word I would use. It's, it's interesting that, I mean, that there may be a trend across different fields toward concentrating resources in a few projects. I think that's been out there a little bit. They're written about more in the pages of science and nature um, and the scientists than in the general press. But I have seen some, especially around the time of the Genome Project, that people that discussed this idea of sort of huge amounts of money going to uh, these big efforts as opposed to funding uh, more independent things and in smaller science. And Do you think there's research about public opinion regarding this? Well, I think people, people think you, uh, you know, it's hard to form a, an opinion on the whole trend generally, but I think that it's good to have more voices out there talking about why it might be dangerous to put all our money into I a few. I whether it's dangerous or not, just yeah. what people think. Yeah. You say it's dangerous? I don't know. I mean, if it, if it starves more independent type people, of, of funds, or it makes it impossible to get funding doing something that's off the beaten track, then it could be that the science needs diversity. And so if it's all going in, if all the money's going to the same thing, I think it, it's something that, that reporters would have an obligation to try to, to point out. Because really, it's, it's a lot of R01 grants. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of what? It's a lot of R01 grants, which is a traditional rule of funding in biology. And it's, yeah, even more Do you have an example of a small science project that was important and successfully promoted or reported? I'll have to think about that. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, come up with something I, on my for, for my uh, next talk on that. Um, what, I mean, the discovery. What about, me, what about measles? 
<laughs> goes back, goes back a ways, but you know. <laughs> Discovery of other genes was done on an R01 grant. It was done for hundred million dollars. Uh, what was? The discovery of oncogenes in viruses. Oncogenes. Okay, there's a good one. Bishop and Vomus won a Nobel Prize, hundred fifty thousand dollar grant. It, so, there's a lot. I mean, biology yeah. always worked in small units yeah. of money. It's just until things like the Genome Project came along where it was. It's more like it got more like physics. Yeah, yeah, but I think that. This is the institute of theoretical physics. Theoretical physics is still completely small. Yeah, practically free. These are two out of three physics Nobel prizes were single investigator research. They weren't big projects. Yeah, and so and I think a lot of those uh, get you know they get publicity, especially if uh, they get a Nobel Prize. But otherwise, I mean, we're all, uh, we're all, all of the time that we're not sort of sucked into these big stories, we're trying to look for interesting things. I'm I was constantly at Penn and other uh, institutions around in Princeton and the Institute for Advanced Study, looking at what people were up to, and some of it's uh, you know you you see individual stories as opposed to everybody covering the same thing, which is a result. Of, Example, a small, wasn't that okay. case a small science project where somebody got a Nobel Prize? Oh, yeah, five. Helioback. Helioback, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that replaced the whole pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it was just antibiotics to treat the bacteria that cause stomach cancer and uh, instead of uh, tons and other kinds of things. Yeah, so these guys and these doctors in Australia were just, yeah. you know, off on their own. And, discovered that everybody had always been wrong about the cause of ulcers. Well, that brings us back to the thing you said earlier, which is important, I think, which is as reporters, we don't want to be wrong. And if we're reporting a plane crash, you know, that's pretty easy to get, you know, figure out if that's right or wrong. But science is really different. Right? Can you talk some more about how you go about determining if your story is going to be correct or not? Well, yeah, I think mean, that that you you don't want to have to guess on whether something is is correct. You want to you want to give the uncertain you want to uh, you want to communicate the uncertainty, the uncertainty of the scientists, the uncertainty of the community. If a couple of scientists say they they've got neutrinos going faster than light, and everybody else says, well, it's unlikely, then then you you have to communicate that. You don't. It's not our obligation to guess which one is right. It's to communicate what's known and what isn't. And I think that's the same with. Uh, claims related to uh, medical breakthroughs that you you that we have an obligation to reflect uh, the uncertainty, even if it even if it moves our story off of the front page and turns it well, that's into. That's part of the problem. The when is uncertainty news and when is it not news? How does that it's happen? well, the uncertainty is always part of the news with science. I mean, because it is—it's science. It has to. You ha, it. You can't. It's not about guessing who's right. We don't know. And there are times when we're pretty sure. Like with the neutrinos, I think people were pretty sure that it was wrong. But uh, I, and I think that that uncertainty was reflected. And sometimes you can have a false uncertainty. Like um, they, you know, there are people that try to uh, drum up more uncertainty than is warranted with climate change and uh, you know factions that try to say oh, we really don't know what's going to happen with the climate we have no idea we have no idea whether carbon dioxide really does anything to the atmosphere so there's uh, you know that there's also a certain amount of common sense in figuring out whether the uncertainty is genuine or whether it's being generated by somebody with an interest uh huh can you comment on what's happened with the autism vaccines like on, like vaccines uh, that's a, you know that's a really interesting story and I I didn't cover that myself so I have kind of watched it and in that case it was a it was a scientist who came up with this result that uh, vaccines cause autism and it was a real paper though it was later retracted um, but you know it kind of it that shows that things can really spin out of control because people it's a story that's obviously of huge interest and you know it changed I mean everybody suddenly was worried about vaccines causing autism um, but it, the press definitely didn't make it up and then it kind of 
developed its own momentum because of activist groups and celebrities like Jenny McCarthy sort of getting involved. And so those things can take a, uh, kind of a life of their own. And I think that th those are those can actually spawn new forms of pseudoscience when something is, pseudoscience can start as, as real science. And then when, you know, the result is shown to be wrong, but people don't want to give it up. I mean, there are people that don't want to give up cold fusion, too. So I think the investigative reporter that unraveled that whole. That unraveled the fact that it was wrong, you mean. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of people that I think Impressive. thought it was, uh, thought it was wrong or were concerned about it. Well, unraveled it in such a way that it became indubitable, you know, and nobody could debate it anymore unless they were totally cracked. Which they are. There are many people who... <laughs> well, I mean, it resulted in the retraction of the paper. An investigative so, journalist yeah. actually got the paper. So that, which shows that there is a lot of value in that, that, <coughs> that, that science writers like us can be useful when we actually get involved and, you know, question things. It's supposed skeptical. to... Skeptical. Yeah. Are skeptical and aren't, like, caught up on these bandwagons of, uh, you know, these these manufactured stories. So I think that's a good example. Which investor reporter are you, are you referring to? Uh, Andrew, um, he's a British guy. I, I can't remember his name. He's written a book now, too. But for years, he was going, no, this is not right. And, and he just doggedly went after it and, and, and just went beyond the, what reporters normally do and, and ended up blowing the thing out of the water. So before we derail Faye's train anymore, uh, uh, maybe let her get to her destination, and oh. then uh, we'll save our okay, questions. Okay, I just have a couple more things. I'm actually pretty close to the end. I thought that just because I this is sort of the science story of the week that, and that people were talking about over the weekend, that I would just sort of bring in a little section on this. And I, uh, you know, this is obviously not a pseudo event. This is a real thing that uh, I, it came out of the sky and exploded over a populated area of Russia. Um, got a lot of attention. And I thought, you know, what was interesting to me was the press releases that I was bombarded with over the next three or four days from various factions and groups saying that they thought it was, uh, this was an important warning and we should spend a lot of money deflecting asteroids. And uh, so, uh, you know, I was amazed at how many different people are in business to try to do this. <laughs> And uh, I was actually talking to a geophysicist uh, over the weekend who had been interviewed in, um, uh, by a newspaper reporter and had also been on TV. And I, I said, well, don't you think that it would be important to explain to people that there are a lot more small bodies out there than big ones that could destroy the whole Earth and you know, that we're actually much more likely to be hit by relatively little ones like this than you know, the kind that wiped out the dinosaurs? And, and he said, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, because there are orders of magnitude more little ones than ones that are going to destroy us. And I said, well, did you say that? And he said, no, because I just assumed everybody already knew it. And I think you know, that's another example of something where there can be a disconnect between the way scientists think and, you know, what people in the general public think, because he probably could have helped people kind of put it in perspective if he had I uh, realized that that's actually not obvious, that most people don't really realize that. In fact, with all these sort of uh, people trying to scare everybody, people think, oh, well, we're just lucky that this one was little. It could have just as easily been huge and wiped out you know, half the world. So, well, um, it was because it was on the same day, right? So yeah, it was on the same day as a five, this, yes. It could have been also the big one. Yes. That's what people thought. For people. Yes, exactly. It was kind of a weird coincidence yeah, <laughs> that there was, a, there, was a, there was an issue which was not reported correctly, right? Which is, what is, how big was this? Some people said it was 7,000 tons, and, and the Russians said it was 10 tons. And nobody picked up on yeah, it. Yeah, because that explains estimate the size yes. of it. Yes, that's it, and that's sort of an interesting follow-up story because I think the, people are still arguing about that because it, how do you, you know, you have to sort of, it's kind of a detective story to figure out from the the aftermath of it. I uh, since there was the the rock didn't actually land, it exploded. So that and that might be a really interesting science story to talk about how you figure out what this thing was. Um, but uh, you know what? What I uh, I thought that it was very interesting that I think that there's sort of general misunderstandings in the public that PR people are very aware of, and so they uh, you know they really exploit those right away. And this was just one of yeah I just picked this at random as one of the flood of press releases I I got, and um, you can see you know as I thought it was interesting the way that they use numbers here and that they're saying I uh, that they're estimated to be more than 10,000. Near-Earth asteroids, it could destroy a major city, and 100 that would end civilization. Near-Earth asteroids are confirmed at a rate of more than 900 per year. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but as yet little is known about their 
composition or structure. And so this all, you know, it sounds really scary to a lot of people because near sounds like, you know, why would they call it near if it wasn't like kind of whizzing right by our heads? So actually that term has a specific meaning in science that's not quite as near as most people think. And that number could be high, it could be low. It's sort of, you know, this, it really doesn't mean much without an explanation of how near these near things are and how likely they are to hit us. And uh, I, so I actually asked my geophysicist friend about it, and he said, "Well, you know, actually, I, you know, you might think from reading this that you're really, we're really lucky that um, we're here. And you know, how unlikely is it that we could be here with all these, these space rocks flying over our heads, ready to, to uh, smash us to oblivion? But, but it's actually they, the, the big ones don't come that often, and it's not that surprising that over the course of history, exactly zero cities have been destroyed by asteroids, but a lot." of cities have been destroyed by earthquakes and hurricanes and floods and uh, tsunamis and various kinds of bombs. Uh, and I think in a way also, uh, you know, to put it in perspective, uh, if we don't do anything about this asteroid threat over the next couple of years, well, the result will probably be nothing. We'll probably be able to get away, you know. The chances are we won't be destroyed by an asteroid in the next couple hundred years. But if we don't do anything about the buildup of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, the chances are actually pretty good that we'll see some catastrophic consequences. So uh, I think that, um, you know, there are, there are sort of smart ways to think about this uh, and put it in perspective. Well, I'm just about uh, wrapping up. Um, I had a couple of a uh, couple of kind of final ideas about this. One is that I think that. Um, uh, I, I never really liked the uh, term dumbing down because I think it implies that using really simple, understandable language is bad in some way. I mean, if you look at the asteroid press release, I think, I mean, would it be uh, dumb for a reporter to take that scientific language and translate it into something that people could find useful and understandable about the relative risk of these things? Or would it be smart to just parrot the, the numbers that the press release gives and the language they give, which might give a you know, different impression. So, and my conclusion is that in science, the reality really is much more interesting than the hype or the pseudoscience. And so that's kind of an advantage that we all have, that there is something really genuinely exciting going on in science. And I think that um, that's why we really can work together to uh, promote a, a genuine uh, understanding. And that it's, you know, that the real, the real picture can be more complicated and more difficult. There's a lot going on. You want to about, uh, write about what, why the Higgs particle was really announced when it was? Well, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Probably a whole book rather than a newspaper article. But, but I think uh, getting all that information is worth the effort. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Yeah, I, I think that I think that most scientists would like to see science read and educate them. That it, it's a conduit between the scientific community and the public that would give them enough education so they'd understand the value of science and would be useful to science. However, I've heard many reporters say, and in fact, reporters from the New York Times science team say that they are there to entertain the public, not to educate the public. And their editors are forcing that concept of entertainment with balance. Uh, you always have to have a negative person who's, who says that this isn't so important, and a positive person says it's very important and so forth, but education is not their goal. What do you think of that? I think that? that's unfortunate. I mean, I think that that you can be a good teacher and be interesting. You know, I mean, you have to be, you can't be boring and be a journalist. Your stories have to be interesting. But I think that, you know, the reality is interesting. It just takes more work to get there. So uh, I, I don't think that, that that's an either or situation where you have to be educational or you have to be entertaining. I think that, that if, you're, if you're educational and you really get, uh, you know, capture the essence of what's exciting about science, then people will also maybe not be entertained, that sounds kind of superficial, but I uh, will be intrigued and enlightened. And so, um, you know, it's unfortunate if they feel they're, they're getting that pressure. I always felt, I've fought with every editor I ever had. You know, I think that's part of being a reporter. And um, the more recent ones were the worst, but, but it doesn't mean you have to give in to that. Yes. Well, just following that up, what do you think of like TV shows like Big Bang? 
theory. Is that thing good or bad? You know, I, I need to start watching that. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I don't even have, you know, that little apartment that I'm, I'm staying doesn't have a TV, so I haven't actually watched TV um, since I since I got to Santa Barbara. Um, but you know, some TV can be good, and I uh, that's I guess people like that show, so maybe it's. It's positive, but I haven't watched it, so I can't directly. I mean, sometimes TV can give people kind of a, a you know, distorted picture of things too. It's definitely um, not, you know, it's not this. It's not a substitute for reading. I guess I wouldn't be in, in the writing field if I thought it was. Yeah, uh -huh. How much pressure is there on reporters to give? Maybe an artificial balance to stories? No, I don't get any, but I think... antagonistic point of view, when that might be an extreme minority point mm, of view. Yeah, I don't get that pressure. I think that, that, that some publications may do that, but if they really, the editors don't trust their reporters, I think sometimes you might get that by mistake because you're just interviewing a sample of people and it's not the best sample of people you could interview. And so you get some naysayer one. There's actually pretty good consensus or, you, you know, you're... Yeah, the problem is, yeah, you especially when you're you're um, you know working on a deadline and you're sampling people, and you might not get a, a representative sample. If you, of course, if you if you write about the same fields of science over and over, you do get start to get an idea. I mean, I covered physics pretty much exclusively when I was at Science, and I had a pretty good idea of where the consensus was and who thought what and who said what. So if you have that picture, that mistake is less likely to happen. I think sometimes it's it is just a mistake that you get somebody, but. I, there may be other people that get that pressure uh, to present both sides of things where there isn't, especially like evolution or um, climate change. Uh huh. Uh, I wanted to come back to the, to the title of your talk, and I, I would still love it if the two of you perhaps would take a four-hour afternoon and take those of us who are interested in the title of your talk. And you give us a little four-hour course writing a press release. Oh, okay. And we could each pick some story that we were involved with or a story that we liked, was interesting, maybe didn't get any press, and write a press release and then have you critique it. Okay. So that it's something that is how you present a material that will intrigue somebody enough to notice it without overselling it. What thinks that if you're writing the press release for your press office, which is usually what's going to happen, how to make it intelligible without dumbing it down, without sensationalizing it, and yet also making it futuristic. Yeah, no, that's uh, that would be fun. I mean, I would be happy to do something like that. And I think Could that you discuss that. Yeah. Waters and the that you draw. Yeah. Bart, um, to come back with the, to the teaching issue, many of our visiting journalists have told us. To get published, it has to be news. So you can't just take a topic. You have to take something that an editor can identify as timely and interesting. Well. And that's pretty much an invariant. That's true, but the great thing about science is so much of it is new to the general public. Sometimes the things that people find most exciting about a story are the things that, that we all knew 10 years ago, but they just, people are like, just like the idea of neutrinos. You know, most people don't know what a neutrino is, or the idea that you could send it through the ground and pick it up on the other side. So there's actually a lot that you can work with just in the fact that a lot of this is new to people, and you do need to have some currency when you're working in the media, but it doesn't have to, it can be a trend, it can be, all, there are all kinds of things that can, without having it to be the, a sort of a pseudo event that you manufacture. Are you yeah. sure that the general public actually cares about science to the extent that you seem to suggest? For example, you could tell them neutrinos are passing through your body all the time. Millions and billions of them. Or dark matter is going through your body all the time. And that would, that's this kind of sensational stuff that they would eat up. Whereas, and they want to know that this meteorite is, is, is destructive. I mean, nobody's interested in the details of how large it is, what is the real probability that a meteorite is, you know, how often have extinction events happened on the planet. Maybe that should have been covered. Dinosaurs died as a result of one of these, but that happened 60 million years ago. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's part 
of the challenge of my job is to present things in an interesting way. So I think that I, there are scientists I know that are going to Russia right now and that there's going to be sort of a detective story to try to understand what happened. And I think that can be that can be presented as, as an interesting story. So there's a challenge for me. And also, I think the general public is a, is a diverse group. But I do know people that follow science the way people follow sports. They love it. And you know, there are a lot of people that really liked science in high school, including me, that just didn't go on to become professional scientists and still are really curious about uh, what scientists are doing and what they're learning about the natural world. Yes, so I, I guess I'm converging with the previous question here because I still don't get it, okay? In the sense that uh, there are a lot of uh, tips of what is uh, bad journalism, bad communication, good communication, but this is not giving me uh, indication on how I get uh, your editor interested in publishing some good... You have to get me interested and then I'll find a way to get the editor interested. <laughs> so it starts... No, it really... You, I mean, it, it, it's really my... You know, my job is to convince the editor and so you, you, you've already convinced me that it's interesting. I mean, we, and we could talk about the, the, you convince the reporter, and then the reporter has to convince the editor. And um, it's, it's definitely doable because if there's something that's new to the, if it's new to the general public, if people don't know about it and it's, it's exciting, and some of the things you're working on are, then I think, and there's, there is a trend. It doesn't have to be something that happened yesterday. Then it, it can be fodder for a really interesting feature story for a lot of different publications. Researcher have a set of science journalists on their speed dial? Yeah. Well, we have you on the. Actually, it's good to be on our speed dial because we count on people to get, you know, when there is a news story breaking, one of the ways that I try to avoid falling into the trap of parroting what, the, what they're telling us to say is to get on the speed dial and call the scientists I know and say, so what do you think? You know, what's going on here? What do you think about, did you see this genome announcement? And then they say, oh, yeah, you know. And so you get, you get perspective. So it's good to be on a reporter's speed dial because uh, we count on you and it's not necessarily promoting your work, but it does a huge service for us to have, have scientists as sources uh, to comment on other things. Let's thank Jay and we can speak with her partner.